Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fireside Chats with the Library Company of Philadelphia. My name is Emily Guthrie, and I am librarian at the Library Company, and I'm super excited to welcome Darren Bray and Peggy Hodges as our guests on tonight's episode. Darren Bray is the owner and principal auctioneer of Bray & Company Auctions in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He has carved out a career as a scholar, dealer, broker, and consultant in American furniture and folk art. The co-author of To Please Any Taste, The Furniture and Furniture Makers of Litchfield County, 1780 to 1830, and a contributor to Harbor and Home, Furniture of Southeastern Massachusetts, 1710 to 1850, he broke new ground with his award-winning book and exhibition, Bucket Town, Wooden Ware and Wooden Toys of Hingham, Massachusetts, 1636 to 1945. Peggy Hodges is a writer, historian, and professional genealogist working in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She has collaborated with Darren on several projects and publications and is the author of works of both fiction and nonfiction. Together, Darren and Peggy co-authored Loud, Naked, and in Three Colors, The Liberty Boys and the History of Tattooing in Boston in 2020. Published by Rake House, a firm specializing in the history of tattooing and popular art in America, the book won the Leadership in History Award presented by the American Association for State and Local History. Darren and Peggy, we're so glad to have you both here tonight, and I'd be happy for you to go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to just do a quick little introduction and talk a little bit about why Darren and I decided to do this book. Um, Darren and I had um, undertaken one project previous to Loud Naked and in Three Colors. Um, so we knew that we worked well together. Um, Darren is our material culture guy. He has a, has a supernatural ability to find things and to connect with people who have things. Um, and I have good genealogy and research chops and good writing chops. And so together we are kind of a fairly complete package. And when we began, Darren is the one who uh, had quite an interest in tattoo history. And that grew out of his interest in um, circus and sideshow history. And when he decided that he wanted to look into possibly doing a work on the history of tattooing in Boston, and he started asking around, what people told him was that, well, there's just, there's nothing out there. There's just nothing out there. And uh, Darren said, of course, well, we'll see about that. Um, so that was kind of the first reason why we decided we wanted to, to do the book. The second reason was that um, we realized, based on looking at um, the kind of tattoo scholarship that was out there, that there was a real need for the kind of history that would look beyond the connoisseurship of um, tattoo flash art, the design paintings, and would focus more on discovering the lived experience of these early tattoo artists, um, trying to peer beyond or through what is very often the very thick curtain of the stories that they invented to, um, uh, to make themselves seem larger than life and more interesting um, and therefore more marketable. So Darren and I um, kind of embarked on an attempt to achieve this through intense and very deep research, um, uh, researching material culture, oral histories from uh, elderly tattoo artists and their families, people who were still surviving, still, still living, who had family photographs and artifacts, um, a lot of um, uh, research in archives and online, newspapers, court records, vital records, censuses. And we found an amazing amount of material. 
And the stories that those materials tell us and the stories that the family survivors tell us are so very human and so very fascinating and impressive um, that we found that we had something very worthwhile on our hands. Um, so that's kind of the story behind the book. And um, now we're going to tell you a little bit about the Liberty Boys. And when we talk about the Liberty Boys, we may, we may in Edward, Dad, Liberty, the father, and his three sons. So it was two generations of Liberty men who dominated the Boston tattoo trade for about 60 years through both world wars and until um, tattooing was outlawed, banned in Massachusetts in 1962. So Darren, take it away. That's right. Um, so our story really begins here. This is a photograph of Scully Square, which unfortunately no longer exists. It was torn down in the early 1960s during a big urban renewal project in Boston. Uh, but for decades, it had been the city's gritty entertainment district. This is where the strip joints were, the dive bars, the dime museums, flop houses, burlesque theaters, and of course, the tattoo shops. And these stars that you see here represent the location of various Liberty family members tattoo shops in this year, 1948. They literally had cornered the market on tattooing in Boston, which was uh, sort of a unique thing. There was major tattooing centers in all major cities in America, um, but nowhere else have we found did a sort of group of people have like a near monopoly on the trade. And that's not to say there weren't other tattoo artists in Boston. There were, they would sort of drift into town for a few months, sometimes a few years, but inevitably they would leave and the Liberties for the most part stayed put. And as Peggy mentioned, their career there spanned six decades, uh, which is quite an accomplishment in what is and was a very difficult business uh, to succeed in. The patriarch of the Liberty family was Edward Wentworth Liberty. He was born about 1883 uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. He was of French Canadian descent. And Lowell is a old, old factory city that's about 30 miles north of Boston. And it relied on immigrant workforce to um, work in its textile mills, its foundries, and its factories. And this is what brought the French Canadian Liberty family to Lowell in the first place. However, this was a family that opted not to embrace the wage work that one found in the factories and textile mills. Instead, they developed a pattern of um, operating interesting small businesses that kind of supported their neighborhood. They lived in an area that was kind of a little bit of a mini Scully Square of its own. It was Lowell's Entertainment District. It was the transportation hub where the train station and all the trolleys kind of came together. And there were the usual gamut of, um, uh, of services and products available for a very transient and wide ranging kind of um, group of travelers. Same kind of thing as in Scully Square. So, Edward's mother opened a grocery store and that she maintained and ran for many, many decades. And it was a very, very important financial backstop for the family um, as uh, you know, their, their financial fortunes uh, ebbed and flowed. The grocery store was always there. The boys helped out at the store, they clerked there, but they also did, they were not interested in working for other people. They, um, they like to set up their own businesses. And because it was a very working class family, didn't have a lot of money, they always um, went for these very low overhead um, kind of popular entertainment ventures. So one of Ed Liberty's very first ventures was a little shooting gallery. 
that was located near where he lived. And what we have there is an example of one of the little targets that were printed for him. And we like especially to talk about this in conjunction with the um, tattoo business card, which is a very, very early business card for Ed. Because Ed told us told the story that he got started in tattooing because there was a tattoo artist who was tattooing in his shooting gallery. But the man wasn't paying his rent. And one night he just up and left and left his tattoo gear behind. And this is how Ed came into his first tattoo kit and became interested in tattooing. Okay, next, next one, dear. Okay. This is one of the great pieces to surface during the course of our research. This is a photograph of Ed Liberty tattooing outdoors underneath a tent. Um, in addition to tattooing, or tattooing in like shooting galleries uh, owned by him and his brother, he also would take gigs with regional sideshows and carnivals. He would work as the electrician on the show, but also as the tattoo artist. So presumably this is him at one of these New England carnivals. We don't know exactly where uh, the photo was taken, but the resolution is so good um, that we can, like, you can actually see the artwork hanging behind him in pretty good detail. That's all hand painted um, tattoo designs, what people call today flash, tattoo flash, flash art. And every single piece he signed and dated like 1921, 22, 23. So this whole setup, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was put together fairly early on in his career. Uh, what we learned after we started digging into the project is that the Liberty family saved like a good Yankee family. They saved everything. Uh, but the one thing we haven't been able to find is this early artwork um, that Ed used. And uh, by the way, what he's, what the image is showing is cosmetic tattooing, which is something that a lot of tattoo artists offered during that time period. So this is supposed to be a promotion for him uh, putting permanent blush on a woman's cheek. Uh, she doesn't look too enthusiastic about it. I've often wondered if this is actually um, uh, his wife, which we never were able to uh, determine. But in any event, that early flash doesn't survive, or if it does, we haven't found it. But what does survive are about 12 sheets of hand-painted tattoo flash that hung in his shop in the early 1930s um, and later. And we know this hung in his shop because the flash that survives in the family can be seen in early photographs that show the inside of Ed's shop in Scully Square in Boston. And the designs run the gamut from patriotic and military uh, to Japanese and religious. You could find just about anything uh, on the wall. And he would have offered hundreds of them to choose from. One of the really cool things about this group is we don't actually know if he painted it because according to family tradition, his wife, Lena, was a bit of an amateur artist and she would sit in the shop and paint flash for him. So it's possible, maybe even likely, that we're actually looking at Lena Liberty tattoo flash painted for her husband, Ed. Um, there's actually still a lot to learn about her because there are uh, a few things we found that indicate that she also tattooed in the shop. We haven't quite been able to pin that down, but it uh, seems likely. And here are two more sheets that uh, came to light during the course of this project. These are, it's hard to get a sense for the scale uh, on the screen here. These are much larger than the sheet you just looked at. So these designs are two or three times bigger than the designs I just showed you. And that's because these large spreading eagle, eagles and three-masted ships were intended um, as tattoo or uh, chest tattoos or stomach tattoos, much larger pieces. When, um, when Ed Liberty began tattooing, he was still living in Lowell. He was working primarily as a machinist, locksmithing um, and other odd jobs like that. 
And he would go down to Boston. He'd probably take the train down into Boston and would set up with his tattoo kit basically anywhere he could. Um, it might be a Penny Arcade. Um, he'd set up in a little corner there. He, it might be in a pool hall. He might share space with another tattoo artist, but he moved around a lot. And just as he was kind of starting to get settled, right around 1923, 1922, 23, a, a very large street widening project went right through Scully Square. And most, if not all, of the Boston tattooers picked up and left for about a year, year and a half. And the letter on the left is um, a response to a letter that Ed Liberty had apparently sent Percy Waters, who was a very, very well-known um, Detroit uh, tattoo artist. And Ed had apparently inquired about whether there was any space available in Detroit where he could come and hang out for a little bit and tattoo. And um, Percy Waters gives him a very lukewarm uh, response and says, well, no, not really. Um, and so Ed did not go to Detroit. What he did instead was he went to the West Coast. He started off in the Pacific Northwest in Bellingham and Seattle and interacted and met and worked with many of the leading West Coast tattoo artists who were working there. And then he made his way down to Los Angeles. And this was a really, really formative experience for Ed Liberty. There were quite a number of really innovative and very talented tattoo artists working in Los Angeles in the very early 1920s. And Ed apparently met them all, worked with many of them. And the postcard here is interesting because we have, we know of other tattoo artists who are photographed in this very same scene, in the very same studio. And the studio, in fact, was right next door to a well-known tattoo shop. So as Ed met all of these tattoo artists, they would trade secrets and tips, designs. So all kinds of ideas and materials were going back and forth. And Ed Liberty was amassing quite a trove of West Coast tattoo art and knowledge. And that would influence him when he returned then to Boston. We're fortunate because many of the things that survive in the family collection, which is spread out all over the country now, are these little pieces of West Coast tattoo history that date to exactly the time period that Ed was out there, the early to mid 1920s. And so it makes sense that he would have acquired all this material when he was there. The, there are a lot of things we could show you, um, but this piece on the screen is the most important. So at the time, uh, Los Angeles's premier tattoo artist was a fellow named Ben Corday. And Ed must have met him. Ben Corday tattooed on South Main Street in Los Angeles. That's where the other tattooers were working. That's where Ed was hanging out and no doubt tattooing. Um, ben Corday was also almost seven feet tall. So he was hard to miss. And when he wasn't tattooing, he was acting. He was an actor. So he did a lot of live performances and productions, but also had these like small roles, sometimes bigger roles in silent films. So he was a really known, well-known character in downtown Los Angeles. He also was arguably the best tattoo artist in America at that time, certainly the best painter of tattoo flash in America. And so during Ed's time out there, he acquires this little book. Sometimes people call them travel books today. They're just at the time known as design books or books of designs. It's a little five by seven inch book that uh, is filled with these wonderful hand painted designs done by Ben Corday. The first page has his signature interlocking uh, initials. And it is one of the sort of holy grails of tattoo history. Um, 
I'd love to show you all of the pieces in this book, but we chose just a couple and it's filled with, you know, grotesque stuff, Japanese, naturalistic, um, a lot of patriotic material and also popular culture pieces. So one of the really cool ones is this clenched fist uh, memorializing John Sullivan, the famous Boston boxer. He dies in 1918. So we're guessing this book was painted about then or shortly thereafter his death. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that Ed was gathering up when he was out on the West Coast and then bringing it back to Boston. Um, so Ed does go back to Boston. He goes back around um, 1924. And fortuitously, he arrives there very shortly before the death of a man named Frank Howard. And I, I wanna back us up for a moment now and just kind of set the scene for um, a change that was taking place in tattooing. Frank Howard represented a transitional figure from the, from the mid to late 19th century tattoo culture to the more modern culture that Ed Liberty was an early vanguard in. So Frank and his wife, Annie, decided in the early 1880s that the thing they needed to do was get tattooed from head to foot and become tattooed performers. And that's exactly what they did. And they made quite a career of it. They traveled extensively in uh, regional circuses and sideshows. They performed in dime museums in the off season in the wintertime, all over the country. And in a major coup, they were picked up by uh, Barnum and Bailey's circus. And they traveled the world on two occasions um, with trooping with Barnum and Bailey and advertising themselves as a married tattooed couple. When they returned to the United States and Frank retired in the very, very early 1900s, they settled into Boston. And Frank spun his fame into a spectacular career as a tattoo artist, a, the owner of, a, of the largest tattoo shop in Boston, in, actually in, in New England, and also as the proprietor with his partner, Ed Smith, um, the proprietor of a mail order tattoo supply business. And during this time after he retired, um, his wife, Annie, continued to perform as a tattooed performer in Boston, primarily at Austin and Stone's Dime Museum. So, as Peggy mentioned, when Frank Howard opens up this shop, which um, may have actually been the largest shop in the country, uh, he partners with another veteran tattoo artist named Ed Smith. And together they found Smith and Howard which is one of the first tattoo supply companies in the world. Um, and they sell everything imaginable that a tattoo artist would need. Machines, needles, inks, um, photographs of tattooed people, power supplies, and also designs, hand-painted tattoo designs. This is an example of one of their price lists. It's, it it's a simple sheet of paper folded into thirds and um, lists all the supplies that they offered in the States to about 1905. Um, so in addition to selling large sheets of hand-painted tattoo flash, they also sold these books. Uh, this is similar to the Ben Corday when Corday example we looked at a few moments ago. Um, it's, again, today collectors refer to them as travel books, but they're just these little sketchbooks that uh, usually come in 12 or 24 pages, and they fill them with these beautiful and painted tattoo designs. Um, a lot of the imagery in these early 
flash books is familiar to people interested uh, in sort of, well, American history, American popular culture, because they were borrowing from everything, advertising, uh, prints, pottery, uh, all sorts of decorative arts. You would find these images printed and published on one of my favorite pages from this book is the design on the left, which is sometimes referred to as the sailor's farewell uh, or the sailor's homecoming. I guess it depends. Uh, um, but these are the types of books that Frank Howard was selling. And the company was very successful. So they were distributing this stuff all over the country. And they had a really big impact on not just popularizing tattooing, but making it accessible. It was still difficult to get into, but for the first time, amateur tattooers or novices, you know, had a place to go where they could order the equipment, which was not that easy to come by. This is a photograph from about 1913 of Frank Howard's tattoo shop on Court Street in Boston. And you can see just from the signage, you know, the, the, the flavor of the circus and the sideshow and banners is just all over that with, you know, the riot of text and, and um, you know, the ballyhooed announcements of everything. And you can see that he was basically throwing everything out there any, and hoping that, and just going for anything that would stick. He's selling, um, tattoo designs, machines, hand outfits. He can teach. He, if he, um, he offers uh, people in the shop who speak all languages, who can help anyone in any language. He's selling paintings by another artist. Um, there are just, just about anything that you would want to have in a way of a tat something related to tattoos one could find here. And I want to just take a moment to talk about how Frank Howard and his wife, Annie, came from this earlier aesthetic where tattooing spectacle was central to tattooing. You were a tattooed performer. People came to look at you and to look at your body, your illustrated and inked body. And they also came to perhaps watch you tattoo another person, perhaps somebody from the audience. So there was, there was this element of spectacle and that appealed to American popular audiences because during this period in, in, the, in the decades slightly before this, there was, enorm there was an enormous growth in the American working class and urbanization of the American working class and diversity, diversification of the American working class as immigrants flooded the country and came to our cities to work in factories. And the one thing that, that um, takes over, that manages to overtake all kinds of language barriers, cultural differences is spectacle. So these spectacular shows, dime museums, tattooed artists, circuses, sideshows, these really appealed to these large, large groups of working class people who were looking for urban entertainment. Now when Frank Howard died, which happened in 1925, very shortly after Ed Liberty, got back to Boston, that era was passing. And Ed Liberty was among the kind of the first of the group of tat this generation of tattoo artists to begin to explore that next phase, which would encompass a, a commodification of tattooing, where a tattoo became something that you could pay for. It was a little bit of a thrill and a fun thing that anyone if you had a couple of bucks, you could get, you could do. And it was much less spectacle oriented and it became much more something that someone provided for you. It was a service that was provided, it was a trade. 
And so I like to think that um, that Ed Liberty was kind of finding his way into this new mode, this new culture of tattoo art. And some of his contemporaries still had elements of that spectacle in their, um, uh, their resumes. Some tattoo artists that he worked with were, um, they were masters in balloon ascensions. They did um, vaudeville, um, sword swallowing. They did all kinds of stuff in addition to tattooing. But gradually that kind of spectacle and performance aspect was phasing out. And this is just a, a quick close up of um, all of the things that Frank Howard was offering at his shop. And as Peggy said, Frank Howard dies in 1925 and like right after Ed Liberty returns to Boston. And we don't know if that's coincidental or maybe Ed got a heads up that Frank was sick, you better get back in town. But what ends up happening is Ed takes over Frank's shop. And so he inherits this incredible space um, with uh, um, all of its customers and seems to have also acquired a lot of Frank's work effects and some personal effects, which are, have become a little bit scattered now, but a lot of that stuff passed through the Liberty family over time. Uh, and this is important to us because it's through the Liberties and that collection that we now know what Frank Howard's flash looked like. So here's just one of several pieces that came to light during this project. This is a small sheet, a demon head, painted by Frank Howard at around the turn of the century, signed by him. Um, also, uh, it might be difficult to tell here, but he varnished the design. And that's something that a lot of tattoo artists would do because there'd be a lot of hands and fingers touching these things, people you know, looking through them and pointing out what they wanted to get on their bodies. And so the varnish sort of helped protect them uh, over time. And so this is one of only a few pieces of signed Frank Howard flash that are known to exist. And it's through this group that we are able to identify and attribute other works by Frank. And here's another one. In addition to these smaller sheets, there are three window shades. There are rumors that there are a few more, but we haven't found those yet. Uh, but there's three that we do know about, and these are big. They're 40 inches by 20 inches. It was not uncommon for tattoo artists to paint designs on window shades, uh, probably because they were relatively cheap um, and, to buy. And you could roll them up and take them with you. They were easy to sort of display. Now he wouldn't have hung these in the windows, but they would have lined the inside you know, walls of his tattoo shop. The one that you see on the screen here at the very top, there's a, a banner that kind of wraps around this, this eagle. And at the bottom, it says Smith and Howard for the early partnership of Frank Howard and uh, Ed Smith. And the designs below it are all Japanese for the most part. So um, Ed Liberty is well established in Boston now. He has moved into shop space and uh, we've got a series of uh, images here kind of celebrating Ed Liberty's magnum opus, which he, um, put on the body of a man named Cassius Ezra Church, who was an ex-Navy man uh, who perhaps was considering going into becoming basically a sideshow performer, a tattooed performer. And this gives you an idea of uh, the incredible range of imagery that would go on a large canvas of an entire body. You can see that there are patriotic symbols, there's popular culture symbols, there's the good luck horseshoes, there's flapper girls, there's flowers. Um, you can't, it, it's difficult to see, but on his arms there were um, comic strip characters from the period. And uh, then on his back was certainly the uh, Ed Liberty's finest work. As far as we know, this was the only full body suit 
that Ed Liberty ever did. And this back piece, um, it's uh, you can probably make it out. It's the Madonna and Child. Uh, and Ed Liberty boasted that there were 37 angels in the lumpy clouds all around the, uh, the Madonna and Child. And he also very proudly noted that he had taken more than $700 off of this guy in the course of creating his bodysuit. Oh, and the, the design itself, the, the mother and child, is uh, from a 19th century uh, relig religious genre painting uh, that was very widely known and, and widely reproduced as a print. And these are photo postcards. Um, yeah. Sometimes today collectors call them real photo postcards and they play a really important role in tattoo history. If a tattoo artist like Ed Liberty had produced some noteworthy work, like a full body suit, they would often take the guy down to the arcade or wherever the photo studio was located and produce these relatively cheap um, postcard pictures. And they would buy a stack of them. And then he, Ed would sell them or the tattoo artist would sell them from their shop. Or if they traveled with shows, they would sell them on the shows. And the person in the photograph, who was often a tattooed and aspiring to performer, uh, some of them flamed out pretty quickly. Um, but the idea was that they would sell while they're out on the carnival uh, circuit, they would be selling these as souvenirs to spectators. And so um, most tattoo artists had collections of photo postcards from other tattooers as well and they would like display them in the shops and um so there's just like this really rich legacy of photography that goes along with all of this and we're lucky because if it didn't exist we would have no idea what their work looked like um so another thing that happens is ed sort of rebrands himself in the early 1930s. By that point, he's well established, you know, Frank Howard uh, is gone. It's now like sort of Ed Liberty's town. And he quickly brings his three sons into the business. They had all been tattooing since the early 1920s, but they were tattooing in Lowell. Um, in the same way that he was in small, you know, shooting galleries, pool halls, local fairs and carnivals. But the first chance he has to to bring one of his sons into Boston, he does. And that happens in 1930. Uh, and the other brothers follow. But because there are so many liberties now working in Boston, one of whom has the same name as Ed, he stops going by Ed and starts going by Dad. So from 1930 forward, he's known as Dad Liberty on his business cards, letterheads, shop signs, you know, Dad's tattooing, Dad's tattoo shop, um, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> but it's it's nice because when we see that, we know that it's like it marks this period in time when his children join him in the business. The first son to come on uh, in Boston with his dad was um, Frank Liberty. He was the oldest boy. And he, as Darren said, uh, he began working in Boston probably about 1930, early 1930s. And he tattooed in Boston uh, right through until very, very close to his death. He died fairly young in the late 1950s, I believe. And um, we, uh, Frank is especially interesting because he is the man who we got the quote, loud, naked, and in three colors from. Uh, he loved to, uh, he, lo he was quite the raconteur, and he loved to tell stories to reporters who were wandering around trying to find a good story. Um, and he, he told them after World War II, he, he told them that he knew during wartime when he was slapping tattoos, loud, naked, and in three colors on these sailors, that they would be coming back to have them taken off 
And indeed, taking off tattoos became a big business for the liberties. It was actually um, uh, more expensive to have a tattoo taken off than it was to have one put on. And tattoo artists had their own little recipes of vile concoctions uh, that uh, would remove a tattoo in some of the most medieval ways you can imagine. Um, it usually consisted of uh, using a tattoo machine to drive a very caustic uh, compound under the skin. And then it was wrapped and left to just kind of fester until a big scab was created. And then it was also rubbed with other caustic materials like alum and Spanish fly, silver nitrate, um, you know, all kinds of really, really bad things. So infections were a danger. Scarring was certainly a danger. And then they would wrap that up and just kind of let it cook for a while. And then eventually the scab would fall off. There would be a big pink scar and supposedly it would eventually go back to a normal color. Um, so of course these, these removal um, uh, compounds were not regulated in any way. Um, uh, but they would, but the liberties and any other tattoo artist would happily offer to take your tattoo off for you. And there's about, we don't, Frank is the one member of the family where we're not certain what his flash art looked like. What we do know is there's about a dozen sheets that he definitely used and that hung in his shop. This is one of those sheets. One of the group is dated 1930, which is like, exactly when he moves to Boston. So this is probably his first set of flash, possibly his only set of tattoo flash that he ever used. Uh, none of it's signed. We're skeptical that he's the author of these works because it, it's, um, the quality is pretty good for this time period. Uh, and there's really no indication that he was like a great artist. Um, but anyway, this is one of the sheets that survives. It's uh, this really cool where waters meet design and intended for a large chest or stomach piece. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, um, the des actual design originated at the 1915 World's Four uh, Fair, the Panama Pacific Exposition, I think it was called. And so, you would see this design hanging in a lot of tattoo shops all over the country. This is just the version that was hanging in Frank Liberty shop in Boston. The next Liberty son to uh, come on board in Boston with his dad was Ted Liberty, who was actually the youngest of the three boys. And Ted, besides being the youngest, was also probably the most troubled of all of uh, Ed's children. Um, he had difficulties throughout his life. Um, he had a running feud with his father and his brothers, and um, he had a continuing pattern of coming home, getting in an argument with his family, and leaving. Um, sometimes he left town ahead of the law. Sometimes he left town because he was certain that um, uh, the fields were greener elsewhere. Um, at one point, he ended up down in Baltimore, uh, where the beautiful sign there on the left was painted for him by a man named, was it Fred Irvin? Eddie, Le Eddie Levin. Eddie Levin, who was a very, very fine cartoonist. Um, so we do have some beautiful uh, signage and things from Ted. And of course, there's Ted on the right there. Um, Ted also ended up spending a fair amount of time up in Portland, Maine. Um, tattooing there and getting in trouble with the law. Uh, one very, very cold winter when he had no money to get home for the holidays and was feeling um, quite disgruntled, he robbed a grocery store that was just a couple doors down from his tattoo shop with a couple of other guys. They were caught and charged and uh, Ted spent two months in the state prison in Thomaston, Maine. Um, he seemed to find happier grounds in Canada. Um, and of all the places he stayed, probably the longest he stayed was in Vancouver. Uh, and we do have, again, some wonderful signage 
um, from uh, that period. This is like from the 1960s. And the um, the Polaroid on the right there is, is that a Vancouver shot, Darren? That is, yeah. Yeah, so you can, see, you can see that sign there at the top. And this shows you why it was so important for a tattoo artist to have very loud and very large signs because the entrances to tattoo shops were very often tucked in to a little alcove and were very small. And you would either go down a, into a basement or you would go up little rickety stairs to a tiny, tiny cubby hole over a storefront because that, that's where the cheap rent was. So signage tended to be very large and very bright. Um, Ted came to a very bad end, unfortunately. In fact, we don't really even know where or when he died. He simply disappears. Um, there are records, family letters um, that kind of um, trace his uh, trajectory downward, uh, both physically and mentally. Um, but exactly how he ended, no one knows. And the third brother, uh, Harold Liberty, um, had sort of resisted the family business for a long time. Unlike his brothers, he left New England. He went to upstate New York. He got a job at General Motors, climbed the ladder there, became the foreman of a factory. During World War II, that factory was uh, repurposed and started churning out bodies for bomber planes. And of course his pay was frozen. And so uh, he was happy to like do his patriotic duty. Um, but back in Boston, his dad and brothers were raking in the dough. It, this sort of time period in tattooing is often thought of or referred to as the golden era of tattooing. Because And there are still a few people around who remember this and certainly who we interviewed for the project. But um, in fact, there's one family member in Maine who went to visit Dad Liberty during this time period. And he couldn't even get in the shop because the sailors were lined up down the block. Um, and that's how it was during those years. So they were making a lot of money. Uh, Harold was not making any money and uh, probably didn't take too much convincing. But in 1946, he leaves New York. He leaves his family behind. Uh, they would rejoin him, goes back to Boston, spends a year learning to tattoo from his dad. He's 40 years old at this point. He doesn't have a single tattoo on his body uh, and never would never get one. Um, so he learns the business and then very quickly opens up a shop above a local landmark, a popular restaurant in Boston called The Tasty. Uh, the photos you see on the screen show that shop and him in 1957. And uh, so he joins the family business and he does quite well there. There are about a dozen sheets of flash that survived that we know about that were painted by Harold. He went, his needle name was Lefty. His family never called him Lefty, uh, but in the tattoo world, he was called Lefty because he was left-handed. And he liked to say he was the only left-handed tattoo artist in the country, uh, which was not true, um, but it made for sort of a neat uh, promotional gimmick, I suppose. Uh, and, so there's a handful of his original artwork that survives, including the sheet on the screen here, which was painted in 1946 by Lefty in the year that he returns to Boston. And um, things come to sort of a grinding halt in the city, uh, in New York and Connecticut, they ban tattooing. And the same thing happened in Massachusetts. And so in 1962, the city takes over Scully Square. They evict all of the residents and like businesses from that district. And Lefty, of course, is one of them. He was the last tattoo artist left in Boston, Massachusetts before tattooing was banned. And so he doesn't take any time off. He moves 
just across the border to New Hampshire in a town called Salem and uh, where tattooing was still legal, buys a house and sets up a little tattoo shop on the front porch of the house. And he was worried that his customers wouldn't find him in New Hampshire. And we know this because the family still has his uh, day book, which is sort of you know, half accounting, half journal entries about what was happening. And he remarks in like 1963 that he's sunk, I think is how he phrased it. If his clients don't find him, he's going to be sunk. Well, they do find him. And before long, he's making way more money in New Hampshire than he ever made in, in Massachusetts or in Boston. And so he tattoos out of this little porch for about a decade. In 1973, he retires um, to Florida. And that sort of marks the end of the Liberty family's 60 year run in tattooing. Um, in 50 of those years, they basically had a stranglehold on what was happening in Boston. Um, and so what we touched on tonight is really just, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if you like this kind of stuff, I would encourage you to check out the book there's over 160 images of previously unpublished photographs, shop signs, early tattoo machines, and lots of original artwork. Um, so I think that uh, pretty much wraps it up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both so very much. That was really just an amazing story. And I'm I'm really astounded by how many objects you were able to uncover. I'm really curious. Um, well, first off, let me invite our audience to put their questions in the chat. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, and while they're thinking of those, I'll I'll start with a question of my own. What was it? like to interview the family members? Were they proud of this family legacy? Uh, did you come away with some really good stories or were any of them reluctant to, to talk? <laughs> I would yes to all of those questions. Uh, <clears throat> it really did depend though. So for a lot of the families, particularly the Liberties, Tattooing was a business. First and foremost, it wasn't like a lifestyle. And that's not how a lot of early, a lot of early tattoo artists, it was a lifestyle choice. It was tattooing 24 seven. Mm -hmm. um, but for the Liberty family, the tattooing never came into the home. And so um, I think when we first approached them, they were perhaps a little skeptical, <laughs> but eventually they warmed up to Peggy and I and uh, the, there are three children who uh, we worked very closely with and we did many interviews with over several years and they live in very different parts of the country, but the memories and information they shared with us were really incredible. Um, one of them, and actually there's a fourth, uh, Lillian Liberty, who is approaching 100 years old now and she has memories of going into her dad's tattoo shop in the 1930s mm. and asking him to tattoo her. And he was like, you know, chased her away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was perhaps the most rewarding part of the project was working with these families. I'm curious if any additional objects have surfaced since the, the book was published. <laughs> it's always the hope. Um, and it didn't happen right away, but it did happen. And even just a few weeks ago, I was in Philadelphia um, uh, visiting someone and they pulled out a sheet of early Boston tattoo flash dated 1911. And it's probably the best example of Boston Flash that we've ever seen. So a lot of material has actually surfaced. Um, we've learned a lot more about 
some of the tattoo artists that the Liberties were friendly with, uh, who the kind the guys would sort of drift into Boston for a couple of years and then go elsewhere. And so, I mean, there's another material, there's enough material for a second volume, but I don't, I don't know that we're up for that. <laughs> you know, I don't think I realized that tattooing had been banned in the 1960s. And was, was that mainly out of, out of health concerns? Or what was the I'll, reason? I'll, I'll take that one, Dara. Um, it, it was ostensibly, it was, uh, the ban was ostensibly due to health concerns, um, uh, fears of hepatitis in particular, um, but that was really just a smokescreen. Um, and what I think is that there were a couple of things going on. First thing was, was this push for urban renewal and to um, basically erase um, many areas of cities that were seedy and were uh, viewed as um, slum-like um, or dangerous or, you know, uh, they, were, they were people's homes and people's neighborhoods, but there was this perception that uh, they were somehow unhealthy and unsafe and bad. And so there was a movement to, you know, destroy them and put something else in like a government center, which is what happened in Boston. And then I think the other thing was that um, in the 1950s and moving into the 60s, after the Second World War, there was uh, the middle class grew enormously. Um, and the Cold War also, the Cold War uh, established itself. And I think that both of those created pressure for conformity. And there was, uh, and there was pushback against some of the more subversive aspects of popular culture. And I think that tattooing was um, um, a casualty of that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When was it made legal again in Massachusetts? Not that long ago. I am, wow. don't know if I can remember the exact year, but it's like 2001. That's that what I, yeah, that, yeah. Wow. Um, okay. actually, yeah, it was in the 2000s. Um, so, I mean, people were still tattooing in Boston, but it was just very underground. And, but what happened is like, it forced these new areas to sort of develop. Mm -hmm. So there was now a scene in New Hampshire that didn't really exist that Lefty Liberty started. Mm -hmm. And there was a really strong scene in like Providence, Rhode Island and Newport, Rhode Island that blossomed because it pushed oh, all of that um uh all of that work outside of massachusetts so yeah. but as soon as the law was overturned shops opened up like overnight yeah what what would you say were your best resources on in determining um information about the clientele and how many men versus how many women visited their shops and and um yeah, that, that type of information. Yeah. They it's don't have sitters books or anything like that. No, um, there, there was, you know, the tattoo artists themselves would talk to newspaper men and um, would often talk about the large numbers of, like in Boston in particular, the large number of, of um, fraternity men that they would tattoo. Um, uh, the young ladies who would come in to have a bluebird tattooed on their ankles. Um, so, you know, we kind of assume that there is a certain amount of truth in those statements, probably somewhat exaggerated. Um, but one resource that proved unusually interesting and um, reliable was a stack of consent forms for mm -hmm. tattoo people that were still with the Liberty family. And um, those record the name of the person. They may have given an alias, but you know, there's sure. a name on it and a description of the tattoo. Oh, and okay. 
And one of the most interesting of those permissions was from a person who had a, um, a, a tattoo from a concentration camp that they wanted removed. Mm, wow. So, you know, that that's a very reliable record set. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, your description of, of tattoo removal um, was memorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that works these days, but uh, I don't want to explore that idea. <laughs> lasers now. Oh, lasers, okay, okay. That seems yeah. probably a little bit easier. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we, we lost Darren and it's the top of the hour. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Peggy. And, and please pass along my thanks to Darren. This was a real treat for us and our audience. Well, thank you so much. We certainly enjoyed doing it and we hope everyone enjoyed themselves. Okay. Thanks a lot. Happy holidays. All right. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.